Okay, we'll kick off. So thank you all for joining us today in this webinar in conjunction with WireGov. I'm Michelle Gunter, I'm the Head of Marketing for Tripwire, and I will be on hand to make sure that our time is productive as possible. For those of you that have sent questions in advance, thank you, and we'll be sure to get to as many of those as we possibly can. We are going to make a recording of this webinar that will be made available to you to watch back and to share with colleagues after the event. If you have, if we've got any unanswered questions by the end of the hour, then we'll be sure to add those in also. Our guest speaker for today's webinar is Gary Hibbard. Gary is a professor of communicating cyber at Cyberfort and is a cybersecurity and data protection specialist with over 35 years in IT, even though he looks a lot younger. Uh, he's a published author, a regular blogger, and an international speaker on everything from the dark web through to cybercrime and cyber psychology. So he's definitely well placed to, to host the webinar for us today. Gary is basically going to answer questions that have been asked in advance, but what we ask for this session to be as interactive as possible. You need to be able to use the question um, area on our On24 platform to do that. So when Gary poses a question, what we're simply going to ask you to do is put your response into the question field. Not all of it is anonymous, so you'll be fine with, uh, with regards to any GDPR issues, and I'm sure Gary would alert us to any of those if there was one. So please do make this session as interactive as possible by using that question facility, and I will hand it over to Gary. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you um, uh, for asking me to uh, host this session. And um, it's, a, it's a very interesting session and um, very much focused on PSN, Public Service Network. And thank you for that kind introduction as well. So I've, uh, I've been in this space for quite some time. And um, there have been, over the years, challenges that we've all faced as technology uh, advances. And before I try and position today's session, uh, I'm going to pose a question, first of all, so that uh, people have a time just to navigate to the question field and, and, and respond and give their views. Because as you rightly said, we want this to be as interactive as possible. So if you do have a question, uh, if you do have uh, a thought or an insight that you think is worth sharing, please do share it. Uh, and uh, it is anonymous, as uh, Michelle has said. Um, so the first question I have for you is, is simply this. Um, how informed are you or your organization in regards to PSN? Um, and, and what, if any, challenges do you think you, that you face either with PSN or the future uh, of PSN and its eventual uh, removal, uh, which is, is kind of going to be... Uh, inevitable, uh, I guess, the government's already made that statement. So what challenges do you face and how informed do you feel? So that's the first question I'm going to pose to you. So um, uh, please do provide uh, some of responses within that, that question field. But I think most of us know that the public service network has been around uh, since 2008. It was put in place in order to help public sector organizations work together to reduce duplication and share resources. Now, back in 2019, Government Digital Services published an, an update uh, about the future networks for governments uh, program uh, and the PSN close down, which is supporting the public sector to migrate away from the public services network. Now, it started, uh, it stated, sorry, that organizations should migrate to modern network solutions, which offer more competitive commercial terms, greater flexibility and scalability. Now, they go on to say that these solutions should be uh, appropriately secure um, by using one of the following means, one of more of the following means, using the technology code of practice, relevant government security guidance, cloud guidance and legal regulatory and public uh, obligations like good old gdpr now in announcing this they ushered in a level of complexity which has uh, pre had previously been removed unfortunately this came at a time in 2019 when the world was about to enter into what many would describe as the most disruptive periods in modern history Fast forward to today in 2021, and the world is now adjusting to the, the new norm 
uh, of working remotely or working in a hybrid uh, environment. Now, for most councils, there is a huge drive to support remote working as well as provide digital services with the majority of government departments reporting at least 90% of staff working, um, working remotely, working from home last year. But there is another new norm that we all have had to adjust to. Cyber threats are on the increase, and according to Action Fraud in 2020, they saw a 650% increase in reported phishing attacks and cyber uh, fraud. Um, that was in the first uh, two quarters of uh, 2020. Many of these attacks are indiscriminate uh, and they target everyone from individuals to private and public sector, government organisations and public bodies in the UK will continue to wrestle with these challenges and complexities of protecting themselves as they begin to migrate securely from the PSN. And that's a key word migrating securely from the PSN. This is why we need to have discussions like these today to begin to understand the questions we need to be asking of ourselves, of our organisations uh, and of the government to define our strategies and build our strategies going forward. So that's kind of set the scene. We are in a, a new world, um, a, a complex world, if you, if you, if you like, um, and certainly one where the cyber criminals have recognized that uh, as people are working more um, uh, increasingly remotely, uh, they are disjointed, they are um, separated from their organizations and from their colleagues, and therefore these are windows of opportunity uh, in which to climb through. This is why security is such a fundamentally important part of everything that we think about now when it comes to uh, digital transformation or changes in the way that we operate. And this is a major change in which uh, uh, many organizations will uh, have to face uh, when we think about the PSN. So with that, uh, I'm just going to go back to the, uh, the area here and just see where we are. Um, so, uh, in response to my question, how informed, uh, one of the responses here, how informed, reasonably so, although I'd welcome more information as I think uh, the existing cloud-based services would render a closed public service solution as obsolete. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very good point, actually. Um, I think one of my concerns when it, as, uh, as a cybersecurity practitioner over the years is that uh, again, cloud, yes, it's a very technical um, uh, infrastructure, but it is still seen as just this is the, the provenance, the area for IT to be concerned about. And yet, I'm always at pains to say to people, you need to remember that cloud is just somebody else's computer. So whether it's pub public cloud or private cloud, we need to be thinking more um, in a more business context when we're thinking about how we're storing data and, uh, and who has access to it. If we bring it back to basics, and I promise you that will be a, a repeating theme of today is about removing complexities and thing, bringing things back to basics. We need to um, remember that it's about access control, it's about asset management, and, and thinking through and having a clear strategy around how you are dealing with access to cloud, whether that be um, uh, uh, public services or whether that be a public cloud or private cloud. So thank you for that. Um, another comment we have, uh, if PSN is going away, what is going to replace it? Um, well, the internet, there's going to be lots of other um, uh, cloud providers, there are going to be lots of other service providers who are going to try and step into the breach, step into the gaps where once the PSN was this centrally managed, um, centrally developed to some, dis to, to some extent, um, it will be replaced by internet providers, service providers. So your supply management is going to be one of those uh, really key um, aspects of security and anyone who's un 
implemented any security standards, whether everything from NIST to SANS to ISO 27001 and, and others, uh, and CIS controls, will know that supplier management, third party management is really an important part of that. So going back to what the government's advice is, where they say, you know, you should be considering these uh, aspects, including cloud services, um, but also legal and regulatory um, and security standards. So how is it going to be, uh, what is going to replace it is, is exactly that. Um, in terms of um, the, those standards that we have, of course, um, you have the um, uh, NIS uh, directive as well. Um, again, in terms of all of these standards, when we're talking about control of your suppliers, what we need to recognize is it's about doing your due diligence, making sure that you have in place um, uh, those audits, those regular reviews, and those that onboarding process as well to make sure that the services that you're implementing are, haven't been just rushed through so that you've thought about that and it's a part of your larger, um, uh, your larger strategy as well. So another point, um, as PSN is going obsolete, our digital services also doing away with many good practices guides like uh, GBG uh, 13 as well. If so, what is replacing uh, good practice guides? Um, well, that's again a, a, a great question. Um, what's going to replace the, uh, the good practice guides? I don't think they will be replaced. I think anybody in cybersecurity or um, any technical services who are looking to implement any kind of framework, um, a system, sorry, will usually elevate to or gravitate towards a best practice uh, guidance. And that includes the um, uh, NIS directives. It could be um, CIS controls. It can be NIST. It can be 27001, 22301 for business continuity, et cetera. So there's lots of different uh, standards that people and controls that organizations will look towards. And I genuinely think the good practice guides have been such a valuable asset to organizations for many years. Uh, whether the organizations, the business end, see them or not, certainly as practitioners, we've used them uh, uh, for a very long time. So I don't think, I don't see them disappearing anytime soon. But yes, PSN is going to be obsolete, but then in that case, to, to some degree, um, what I would say is that the good practice guides will probably elevate in status and importance. Uh, okay. So, the, the, so uh, Gary, the, there's another question that's just come in. In general, yeah. how protected are local authorities from cyber attack and how resilient will they be without the PSN? So I guess the removal of the PSN is creating the issues within government organizations with regards to potential cyber attacks being on the increase. Yeah, um, in general, okay. Obviously, I haven't had the opportunity to go into every local authority, so I can't speak for all local authorities. Uh, what I would say is this, that um, local authorities typically um, have very complex systems, internal systems that they are um, fragmented in the way that they operate sometimes. There is not a, a cohesive security strategy across the entire, entire local authority. So I'm speaking very generally here, so apologies if you are from a local authority that perhaps has uh, these controls in place. But in general terms, I have found that local authorities are at risk because they have aging systems, they have um, they are underfunded and under-resourced, and they are the types of organizations that have large swathes of information and data which may be um, unprotected or it may be unknown where that data is, so there hasn't been any true data discovery uh, conducted for any period of time, so data may be sat on servers that are uh, have been decommissioned or set to be de decommissioned. So you have a complex environment and you also have a very um, 
overworked and possibly underappreciated workforce. So this is not just about technology. This is also about people. And again, it's a repeating theme of, of what I say to people is we have to remember that it's it's human interaction with our technology that is um, uh, leaving us at risk more more often than not. So you have a complex environment. You have people working uh, increasingly remotely, people who are overworked um, and uh, perhaps tired and fatigued. And these are perfect. This is almost the perfect storm for cyber criminals. We know that uh, that a number of uh, county council local authorities have been attacked in recent years uh, certainly last year there was a couple of high profile events and any disruption into in such as the removal of the PSN will undoubtedly leave um, leave local authorities at risk from further attack because you are just simply adding to the complexities. Now you've got to look for alternatives to the way that you were working before. You are now people will find workarounds, and if there isn't a cohesive uh, strategy in place to to implement new uh, or onboard new suppliers and new services and such, then again you're you're at risk from uh, supplier uh, supply chain fraud. Uh, and again, we we've seen that. Uh, and I've seen that, and I've worked with uh, with local authorities and organisations who have had suppliers who haven't been vetted. They've had the breach, they've had the issue, and that has then filtered through into the local authority. So, in general, how protected are local authorities? Um, I don't know how well they're protected. Again, I'm going to say they're under underfunded and under resourced when it comes to cyber security and information security. Hopefully that answers the question. There's another question just come through. It's probably easier if I surface them to you, isn't it? Um, sure. So is somebody's asked, will there be any actual impact with the PSN going away? So is compliant just a minimum recommendation, really? Um, wow. OK. Um, you're, you're right in saying that um, compliance is the minimum. So it, compliance is just... I comply with a certain set of um, minimum requirements. It's a, it's a tick box. Uh, will there be any actual impact with the PSN going away? Um, it's difficult to say right here, right now. The impact will absolutely be on your your organisation um, in terms of you, you are increasing costs uh, and complexities because you are going to have to now go and resource and um, and source new solutions. What I would say is that um, I wouldn't want to see anyone trying to replace the PSM by cobbling together and building their own solutions internally. So I think the actual impact will be on manpower and uh, a financial impact as well. So people should be looking for ways to uh, use the systems that they're using currently uh, and build on what they what processes they already have in place to replace the PSN before rushing out and uh, and buying something else. Well, so that, that leads us on nicely, yeah, to another question about managed services. So you talk about um, work, like people being overworked, people being uh, government organisations being underfunded. What about managed services as an option for gov the government sector? Yeah, I, I, I'm. A great believer in uh, in the use of managed services. So, from a um, clearly as a consultant, I'm a believer in using the right people for the right jobs. And having managed services, having someone who is dedicated to uh, supporting uh, your IT infrastructure or cyber security, uh, data protection, whatever it might be. Um, I'm a, a real believer in outsourcing that, but it's about building relationships and it's about understanding ultimately what are your objectives? What are you trying to achieve? And if you can understand what you're trying to achieve, whether that's reducing costs, reducing incidents, um, then choosing your, your managed service provider in the right way, I think is, uh, is, is definitely the way to go. But uh, yeah, definitely a, a great supporter and believer of outsourcing and managed service uh, provision. 
So then another question through or observation, um, one organization still has a handful of existing services that are still reliant on the PCSN network. So I guess when, I guess the question is, if it's going to become a hybrid for a little while, how are they going to kind of support those those existing services? Or whether or not it will just cut straight across, I guess it's what infrastructure is going to be left in place as the PSN kind of leaves us. Yeah, I, to, to be honest with you, Michelle, you kind of answered the, your, your own question there or, or the question itself in as much as there has to be a, a period of, uh, of migration. We don't know exactly when the PSN is going to leave us. Um, some, some estimate 2023, it might be with us for a little bit longer. So there, we have time. Um, but going back in history, I re recall when GDPR became... Uh, the, the hot topic of 2018, people had ha already had two years to um, uh, to prepare for GDPR coming in, and yet still we found that um, uh, come May 2018, people were, were panicking. So my suggestion is now to start to plan your strategy whilst the PSN is, is there now, and, and look at what services you um, you rely upon the PSN for. What do you, what do you use it for? Understanding its criticality to you, and then begin to build your uh, your strategy around uh, removing those critical areas, um, uh, or the, the less critical areas, perhaps move those first, so that they, they, that becomes a test bed. Uh, but definitely, based upon knowledge, understanding what your strategy uh, needs to be. But you're absolutely right. I, I'm not an advocate of just switching things off come the 11th hour. Um, let's do this slowly with um, a you know, keen insight into um, the impact upon your organisation. And then you talk a lot in the uh, content that you've put together before about training, so the training of individuals um, around cyber, so not just um, the cybersecurity experts, but everybody in, in the actual government sector. Um, can you speak a little bit more about how those training programmes kind of you've done before work? Yeah, so I think um, now more than ever, uh, when it comes to information security, we have to recognise that we're, we are in this together. And all too often, we, when I go to organisations and I ask them about their information security, um, they will point to their IT team and say, well, it's their responsibility uh, to tell the teams, tell everybody else about security and why it's important to us. It, Information security is not an IT risk. It's, an, it's a business issue. And what I often say to people is when we're putting our information security programs together, training programs, is to include logic, absolutely talk about the um, importance of password protection and uh, clear desk policies and um, the use of encryption and all these wonderful things that we talk about and backing up. But let's talk to the individual, let's talk to them about their home life and talk to them about um, protecting them at home so that once the, we can get them to understand emo on an emotional level around information security, that this means something to them and they can see the logic then of having uh, a secure password for their banking, then they will start to understand the importance of um, uh, that, that kind of protection within the workforce. If you can explain to them about the scams that are happening out there to everybody, you, me, our loved ones, um, you know, our children, our parents, if you can explain about the scams that are happening out there and about the dangers of phishing at a personal level, then it's not a big leap to then talk about why it's important for them not to click on links when they receive an email from what they think is the supplier. To be the way I like to put it is we need tra to train people to be super sceptical. We need scepticism. It doesn't take long for you to, to look at an email and say, well, what is this? What, is there an emotion that this is trying to evoke? So the logic side of it, we've got down. We're really good at that. But we need to start to put some more emotion into this and remember that it's about people. And the best way to do that and the way that I have always approached it when it comes to train building a training program is to work with the communicators in your business, work with the marketing team, work with the sales teams, but also work with each area of the business to understand 
their perceptions and their views of information security. Because if you speak to procurement, and that's kind of taken us back a little to the PSN, if you speak to procurement about their views of security and what they see the risks are, they may list five or six, you may know of 10 or 15, but you can start to build their knowledge and their experience and their understanding of procurement risks and then go and speak equally to the uh, operational side of the business and equally have the same conversations, but it means something to them. You're not just talking to them about procurement um, and you're not just talking to procurement about operations. So it becomes personal. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's kind of a, a, the approach that we always take with this. And then there's been another question around audits. It sounds like it's a headache for quite a few people and about the preparation for audits. The fact that IT and legal teams have to stop their normal, normal work processes to actually prepare and cater for them. So from your experience um, in Cyberforth, what do you suggest is the best way to prepare for um, audits? Do you do it continually or do you um, just prepare for an audit as it kind of comes up? Um, I. I for, for me, uh, and, I, and I think uh, it's important to note as well within, um, certainly within ISO 27001, because that speaks very specifically about audits, uh, audits should be planned. So whoever it is who's running your security program within your organization, um, first of all, should publish the, the uh, audit plan for the year so that everybody knows that this is coming up. Um, Michelle, you know, I'm, I'm a simple guy. I, I, I like to, I like analogies and I put things into, um, into the context of schools when it comes to audits. When you were back at school, um, I can just about remember that, but um, I didn't just cram for the exam on the night before or, for, or the week before. I knew the exam was coming. I'd been working up to it throughout the year. So, Audits are not just for Christmas, as I sometimes say to people. They are not just to be done once a year. Audits should be gradual. You should be building evidence. But this, again, comes down to the information security um, lead within your organization who should be communicating, these are the audits that are co coming up. These are the things that we need to be able to evidence for these audits so that people are aware of the, the fact that these audits are going to happen and they know what evidences are going to be asked for. And more often than not, and it comes back to the managed services piece, when it comes to uh, consultancy and outsourcing it for to people like myself, I will regularly now get people sending me the evidence even way before the actual audit itself. So I'll get training and awareness evidence and presentations and such, or I'll get evidences of the uh, supplier uh, questionnaires that have been sent out in full knowledge that in two months time I'm going to be coming to procurement to say okay tell me about your new 10 uh, systems and services that you've onboarded have you got some examples of I've already they've already sent me those that evidence because they've prepared for it and I think anything can be a pain if you are if it's it comes as a surprise um, and audits generally come as a nasty surprise but I, um, I often say to people, look, just remove the, the mystery around this. Have an audit plan that's published uh, and let people know what to, what to expect. And as it approaches the audit as well, it's important. I always make sure that the people who I'm going to be auditing have a full understanding. So there's an agenda. They know what kind of questions I'm going to ask. They'll know what kind of evidences I'm going to look for. And I publish that at least a week before the actual audit itself. So again, the people, people have no real excuses when they come on the audits. And usually when they finish an audit with me, they they go away saying things such as, well, I, that was just like a conversation. We just had a chat and you just talked me through things. And that's because they've already provided a lot of that information before. So just remove the mystery, remove the pain. And continual compliance is a big advocate of that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. And, and again, compliance for me is, you know, that's the first rung on the ladder complying with a standard. What we're trying to do here is ultimately, um, you are trying to disseminate information and get people to comply. That's the first level. Next, what you're trying to do beyond compliance is you're trying to affect behavior. Once you can get people to behave different, ultimately what you will then start to affect is the culture within the organization. So compliance is definitely the first rung on the ladder. 
Lovely. And there's another one about, sorry, do you believe cyber essentials and essentials plus are more strictly followed than PSN currently? Um, again, anecdotally, um, I would say so, yes. Um, primarily because of the, with the organizations that I've come across, uh, people see the, the certificate of cyber essentials and cyber essentials plus uh, it ticks a lot of boxes. Again, I'm not a fan of just ticking boxes and compliance, but uh, for compliance sake, but it ticks quite a few of those technical uh, boxes. The government have stated that it's um, having Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus will protect you from um, whatever 80%, 85% of all known uh, threats. But it's that 15% that always worries me. Um, but it absolutely, I think more people have um, an understanding of what uh, Cyber Essentials is and Cyber Essentials Plus and the value of it than the PSN. And I think it's just more broadly understood and suppliers understand it uh, better as well. And then going back to the topic of audits, one organisation has been collecting audit data for years, but they're saying it never really gets looked at. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, that's a bad thing. Um, I, I, I'm, um, I, I have done this in the past where I was asked to collect audit reports and audit information and I submitted it to uh, the senior leadership and submitted it and I asked for, for response and uh, didn't really get any feedback uh, about it. So I just stopped providing it. And um, when they came to, back to me six months later and said, why haven't you provided this information? I said, because no one was looking at it. It was clearly not having any value, adding any value to you. So I'm, I'm a, a consultant who asks, likes to ask the dumb questions. So I'm good at asking stupid questions. And I always ask people, why am I creating this? Why do you need it? What is it needed for? And who, who's the audience? And then I build the audit around the, uh, the requirements. Again, it comes back to something I said earlier, understanding your objectives. What are you trying to achieve? What do you need this for? And once we understand what the objective is, why we need this audit report, then I can craft the audit report to give you what you need, rather than me just bombarding you with information. Um, and again, going back to standards and compliance and such, um, if we think of GDPR for a second, you know, he talks about uh, under Article 5, your, uh, if you like, your second key principle is uh, the principle of accountability. And I always say to organizations, you've got to demonstrate that you are taking security and data protection seriously. Well, how do you demonstrate that? Well, if I'm sending you an audit report, you need to see the findings of that audit report and you need to be acting upon it. Because if I'm telling you that something is glowing red in January and you've not read that report until May, June, July, and it's still glowing red, then clearly there is a problem that we have. There is, again, a disconnect. And it is, again, going back to communication, it's about understanding, well, what does the board need? Why do you need this? And why is, how, why haven't I been able to articulate and communicate the importance of this glowing red audit finding uh, that you need to act upon? So, yeah, I think um, it's a bad thing and um, it's a clear lack of um, leadership and, um, but more fundamentally, a lack of understanding of what the audit report is meant to be doing. So some of the questions that are coming in are kind of off topic with regards to PSM, but I think they're still valuable in answering. So if anybody's got any questions specifically around the PSM, then please do put them in the chat box and Gary can answer them. In the meantime, somebody's gone back to the fact that you talked about training earlier. So security is everyone's job and easier said than done. However, training is actually quite a costly exercise for big organizations. Do you have any recommendations on how to achieve training in a more effect, cost effective way? Yeah, um, be creative. And I say this to um, anyone who has a job in IT, and I say this respectfully um, because I come from an IT background. Um, anyone who's from risk or anyone who's from legal or compliance or from any role which does not traditionally require you to use your imagination. Now is the time to use your imagination. Now is the time to be creative. Again, go to your communications team. Usually there they will be, if you're lucky enough to have one, 
and they will have ways, uh, they will know the way that you've, um, your organization has implemented health and safety. They'll know how you are talking about the environment, for instance. They'll know how you have communicated quality within your organization. You piggyback. It's as simple as that. You piggyback the things that are already in place. If you have a newsletter, well, in that case, get a small article in the newsletter, run a competition. You know, the funniest tweets, the funniest phishing scam you've seen. Get people to talk, get people to see this as an interesting topic. If you have a CEO or a head of an organization, you know, going to be doing a town hall uh, briefing, a meeting um, uh, to the entire organization, ask them just to write them a small paragraph that you would like them to read out during their session. Get war stories from your, your business as well. And again, start to, I, I'm not a massive fan of having a security champions because that it, then it becomes, it's not the IT department's job, it's the champion's job. But I am a fan of rewarding people for great initiatives, so security ideas. And um, one great idea that one organization had is they had a standard template for all of their meeting minutes um, uh, for their team meetings. And one person just came up with this very simple idea and they simply said, at the end of the agenda where they had to talk about X, Y, and Z, they said at the very end, we would ask uh, everybody to share a security related story. And again, there was a campaign around that, which simply said, you know, security related story could be something internally, something that has happened to you, something you've seen on TV, so a, a film that you've perhaps watched and something you've learned. And Instantly, just with one line on a Word document, the whole organization began to talk about information security. And within six months, we had started to go from that compliance phase up to behavioral because people started, we started hearing people how the marketing person uh, started saying, we can't use that password on that portal because it's a weak password. We need to have a stronger password. And that's it. You've now got people thinking about it in the right way. Um, posters, newsletters, uh, if company events, Christmas parties, all of those things. They're the kind of things you don't have to spend a fortune on information security. You can do it very much on a, on a, a boot string. Absolutely. Sounds good to me. So I've got another one through. Um, PSN is something all IT and board members, it's a responsibility of all IT and board members. However, getting board members to take this seriously is a big task, unless there is actually a breach. It seems that importance comes after a breach. So how would you get the board members to engage effectively and understand the costs involved before that obviously happens? Okay. Um, this, again, actually does, does follow very nicely on, on from, um, uh, from the awareness piece. When I work with an organization, uh, one of the first things I will try and do is uh, meet with the heads of, so the board of directors or you know, the heads of the organization. And I want to understand their objectives. I want to understand uh, what their goals are for them, um, both on a organizational level, but also on a personal level. So if their, organize, if their organizational goals are to reduce spend, uh, from a finance point of view or to increase productivity from an operational point of view or whether it's to um, reduce the number of incidents or more technical um, uh, aspects. I'm getting some really good intelligence around what their pain points are. So once I understand some of their pain points, now I can start, or some of their objectives rather, I know what their pain points will be because it's the absolute opposite to, to that. So. If I'm trying to reduce cost, well, I know that if there is a data breach, that there will be the impacts on that will be increased uh, risk of fines. There will be um, uh, remediation costs. There will be the cleanup costs that you, you actually have. And um, if you look around each of the boardroom table, my suggestion to everyone here is just to identify what you believe their objectives are, what they're trying to achieve better if you can actually have a conversation with them to absolutely nail that so that you are you're very clear about it and then start to really put your message together which actually amplifies the benefits of information security so reduction in uh, outages 
obviously that's going to be a uh, reduction in cost because now uh, our IT teams aren't working longer hours. They're not working outside of, uh, at normal hours. If you can increase productivity, if you can keep uptime up, then that's going to increase on uh, productivity. So there are always benefits and positives to, uh, to information security rather than just simply doing what I did at the beginning, which is told you a really bad, uh, you know, nightmare story that cybercrime is on the increase and therefore we have to increase security. Well, that's a very general uh, uh, understanding. Everyone knows that, but it doesn't affect me. Whereas if you can make this, again, I'm going back to it, if you can make this personal to the individual and say, would you like it so that you don't get a phone call on a, a Saturday afternoon when you, you know, you're going to the football match or you're spending time with the, the, the family, um, just to tell you that we've got had another outage. Well, I, we can by investing over here, we can make sure that that doesn't happen. We can reduce the number of times where you're going to get a phone call out of hours so that you can spend time with your loved ones. That's a message that not very many people will actually go out and give. So I think spinning it into a positive way will get people to, uh, to start to take um, a bit more ownership and, and take notice, I guess. And then someone's coming back to the earlier conversation around auditing and have said, our organization is trying to save costs so we're pushing us to reduce the scope of devices being audited. Is this not a security risk? Yes. Next question. No, I'm kidding. I was going to say, that um, was a quick answer on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's not like me to give a quick answer. I, I do realize that. Uh, but I will keep it as short as I can so we can get a couple more in. But yes, it is. Absolutely. And again, um, if the organization wants to do that, then someone has to own that risk. So I've often said to people, look, um, you know, I, I guess I'm a little bit follically challenged here, but I didn't lose my hair because I worry too much about these mammoth amounts of risk and the cybersecurity issues that we all face. In terms of organizations, my job isn't to, um, to fight for certain aspects. That's the organization leaders, that's for them. I am almost like your Jiminy Cricket. I'm your conscience who sits on your shoulder and makes you fully aware of the risk associated to you doing something or not doing something. So if you decide to reduce the scope and you give me the, ra the rationale behind reducing the scope is so that it becomes an easier audit and we will pass the audit and you have, you've, you've, you know, you, you've distracted, you, you've, you've, um, uh, separated a, a massive part of the network, which clearly could cause uh, uh, risk or introduce risk into the organization, then that needs to be elevated onto your enterprise risk uh, management framework. It needs to be elevated to the highest levels in your organization. And someone ultimately needs to own that risk so that they will actually, they are accountable for it. And at that point, you talk about the controls that you put in place, but you recognize fully that there, there are risks and someone else makes, uh, makes the judgment call and the de decision on what to do with that risk. Thank you very much. Uh, another one in more directly related to the PSN. So PSNs, PMC 6 and 7 deal with remote VPN, Wi-Fi and recording activities from endpoint devices. What this person believes is that the, the pandemic caused um, what the pandemic caused was to provide VPN securely working from home became a must and it had to be provided very, very quickly. How can you track back to make sure what has been provided is as secure as possible? So I guess we all had to remove, we all had to move to remote working very quickly when the pandemic hit, but how can we make sure that that remote working has now been offered as securely as possible? Um, yeah, great question. Um, this comes down to, um, Unfortunately, you, you're right. A lot of solutions were implemented um, very, um, very quickly. You know, people sh shoot from the hip, uh, implemented things because there wasn't a contingency plan or process in place. Um, I think now is we have this security latency, if you like, where or, or deficit, where we now have a security risk that we have deployed technologies, be that VPNs um, or laptops and, uh, and other devices without any real forethought. So now is the, the time to really do the asset review um, uh, and begin to build up a picture of what assets are out there. So again, looking at all the security frame, frameworks that we've mentioned earlier, uh, 
as part of that, it's about now doing a, a discovery of the, the software that is out there, the devices that are out there, and then going through the process of establishing a benchmark so that in future you know what VPN, what type of VPN, what flavor of VPN that you're going to uh, implement uh, through to whether you're going to implement you know, home routers or whether you are going to be sending out uh, new laptops and mobile devices and such. So it's an asset um, discovery. Um, obviously, there are tools out there that will do the discovery for you. That will look that will um, look across your network to see what kind of devices are connected, when they've been connected, what software is running on them, and again, those kinds of tools are invaluable if your organisation is, uh, you know, geographically spread across um, uh, the country, the the, the world. Um, so yeah, use, utilizing those kinds of tools, I think, is um, fundamentally where it's at. But it comes back to this very simple step of. It's an asset discovery process. It's no more complex than that. Sounds good to me. Um, one question here is going back to when you've talked, obviously, about training and making that much more cost effective. Uh, one organization are trying to work out whether or not they should invest in additional training for staff or actually they should just move over to a managed service provider. What um, do you think in the long term is more cost effective? I think um, long term, I think moving over to managed services, uh, services. the reason being that um, information security awareness should become part of your organization. And um, typically it's given to someone within the business and it's given to someone who is, um, it's not their full time role and they have other tasks uh, and actions to, to perform. This is a ever evolving and changing beast. And it's one of the reasons why I love what I do. And this is why I've done it for as long as I have, because it does not stand still. Every single morning you wake up and there is a new risk, there's a new challenge, there is something else that we face. So therefore, when you are outsourcing this, what you, you, you can never outsource the risk, that's the first thing to say. But when you give this to an organization who are going to manage the service for you, it's their job to keep on top of the, the trends, to keep uh, informed of the uh, be good pe uh, practice guides and make sure that they are telling you the right things. So I've gone to organizations where people are still talking about having complex passwords um, and yet and changing passwords every 30 days, when in actual fact, that's no longer the, the good practice. It's no longer seen as good practice. It's OK. It's fine. It's an approach, but there's lots of reasons why that's a bad uh, bad idea, but certainly keeping on top of what is seen as good practice now by giving that to a, a managed service provider, they will keep on top of the technology, the uh, standards um, and, um, and best practice. Another question just through part of the current scope of work for the F and 4G program is to make recommendations on future assurance. Do you have any insight at all into as to the assurance models currently being considered? If it's a no, we can... <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to say unfortunately not. Um, but what I would say is based upon what uh, what they said previously, so the, for, uh, the FN um, 4G, the Future Networks for Government uh, program, they they've already said that they're suggesting technology code of practice that they have published. Uh, relevant government security guidance is built on um, uh, the various different standards, NIST, um, you know, CIS controls. You've got the uh, uh, NIST directives, you've got 27001, 22301 and various others. So, uh, and cloud guidance is 27017 and 27018. So, there are guidances out there, so I would dearly hope that they would not be looking to reinvent the wheel and build up uh, yet another standard that people have to adhere to. These standards, especially when you're thinking about the PSN going away and you're dealing with end, you know, third parties, uh, organizations who have already achieved ISO 27001, uh, Cyber Essentials, Cyber Essentials Plus uh, and various others, they're the kind of assurances that we should be looking for. That's the value of them. They, they started out at government and they came down and became a commercial um, uh, standard that organizations could achieve. 
So I would hope they're the kind of assurances that the government will start to look at very closely. And I just, yeah, I don't have any insights to it other than knowing that they're already pointing you outwards and saying, take a look at this, take a look at GDPR, take a look at the, the cloud, some cloud guidance. Um, but yeah, that, uh, hopefully that answers the question. Brilliant. And then we just kind of got one final question, I guess, for the audience. If anybody has got a couple of minutes left to kind of respond would be great. So the question is, what would ease your responsibility of being continuously compliant to a cybersecurity compliance framework? And what would it mean to you and your IT team? And how would you achieve this? I don't know if you've got any advice for the, the team at all, um, Gary. What would um, make it easier for them um, from a, a compliance point of view? I think this is a, about, um, again, I'm going to use the S word here, it's strategy. It's building, um, it's having an approach that is going beyond compliance. What we're trying to do here is um, build scalability um, and you know, making sure that we have uh, availability in the, in the systems and the networks as well. So you know, what we, we should be looking for is is, is a, strat a clear strategy which involves all of the organization or key players in the organization that rely upon PSN so that you include people on this journey and it doesn't just become your job or just doesn't become procurement's job or doesn't just become IT's job to do this or compliances and you know insert your own department name in there. But it, it needs to be seen as a collective um, action. You, you could almost, to some degree, um, again, elevating it above compliance, but look at this as almost like the program for GDPR, which did involve all organize, all entities of the organization to get involved. Um, and uh, again, you take everyone on the journey with you. Perfect. I think if anybody's got a couple of minutes just to kind of type in their responses to that, then that would be great insight for us at Tripwire. Right, we're at the top of the hour. There's no more questions that have kind of come through. So I'd just like to thank everybody today for their participation. Thank you very much for the questions. They've really been able to kind of formulate the, the event and hope that it's been of interest and of value to you. Thank you very much, Gary, for your time. We really appreciate it as always. If anybody has any further questions, then ping those into the, the question um, area on the website and we will get back to you. As I say, a recording of this webinar will be made available as well as any unanswered questions will be answered for you. And if you've got any additional information, then we can make sure to put those in too. So expect an email from us shortly with a recording and some additional materials. Thank you very much all for your time today. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.